right. I think we are happening. We are happening. So hello, good to see you. Good to see you, everybody. Um, I, I guess we're, yeah, okay, the microphone's on. I remembered that. Um, everything else seems to be moving the way it's supposed to move, the gears fitting together in the way that they're supposed to, everything like that. Um, I will check periodically so you people can let me know if I've screwed up somehow and uh, plunked on the uh, something I shouldn't have plunked on. Anyway, it's good to be back. Uh, for I saw some of you last night, or some of you saw me last night, or we saw each other, or, you know, virtual, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey, you know how that works. Um, but anyway, so good to, good to have you with me if you weren't with me last night. And uh, we are back to reading, and in fact, pretty sure we're finishing um, the second Ordinary Farm book tonight, because um, I think I've only got like Two little less than two chapters left. So I'm going to just stall for a little bit, um, bibble babble, as I tend to do. And then when I start, I'm going to read till I'm finished. Uh, if I think of something else to say after that, I will tell you so. Um, if not, I may wrap it up early, um, just because I'm not going to subject you guys to like 15 or 20 minutes of, of uh, unscripted <laughs> tad blah, blah, blah. Um, you might enjoy it, but I have... A, a, a tiny strand of pride left, a tiny strand of pride. Um, in fact, I, I, I watch a lot of YouTube and everybody else on YouTube is, you know, doing these scripted things. Not everybody by any means, but the kinds of things that I watch um, are scripted. And so, you know, the people actually sound like they know what they're talking about, which is how it should be. That's that's how it should work. Um, whereas on the few, the, the few occasions when I accidentally watch some of these broadcasts and, um, I see myself just going blah, 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 um, blah, 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 blah. Um, it makes me feel sad inside because I'm supposed to be a word person. That's supposed to be my professional status. And yet I'm just talking and not even talking in particularly coherent, useful ways. So that's one of the things I'm thinking about, by the way, for the future. Um, not necessarily stopping reading altogether or anything, but I would like to do some other kinds of broadcasts that were a little more prepared. Um, I know there's a lot of things now that I have reached this mature state in life um, where <laughs> I have favorite things I would like to share with people for, you know, in the off chance that they don't know them, that they weren't fortunate enough to have been exposed to them or just because they're much younger than me. You know, I do have young readers or younger readers anyway. And um, not all of them have been exposed to all the things that I have. And some of them are so wonderful that I would love to share them. Now, I know a lot of my regulars, you know, especially the regulars who are about my age already know a lot of the same things that, that I, I know and like. Um, for instance, today, just running through my mind at random all day long, for no reason I can tell, um, is uh, it was a Tom Lair song. Now, those of you who know Tom Lair know what I'm talking about. You know, he, he was, I mean, good God, this is over 60 years since most of his stuff was written. He was in the late 50s, early 60s that he had his sort of pinnacle of public success. He, he largely uh, moved back out of the public eye and then went on actually teaching for 30 or 40 years after that. Um, but he was super, super successful. He was very funny. He also said one of the most uh, appropriate things that anybody ever said um, back in the early 70s. And somebody asked him uh, about 1972 or 73, he said, they said, why um, aren't you writing political songs anymore you know why don't we hear you writing about the, the events of the day and he said really honestly when Henry Kissinger won the Nobel Peace Prize I said to myself clearly satire is dead <laughs> which is so those of you who were alive back then will know what he's talking about you know Henry Kissinger was maybe maybe still is he's still alive Henry Kissinger may be a lot of things but a promoter of peace especially in Vietnam, which is what he got the Peace Prize for, was for brokering um, the uh, what became the eventual uh, American slink out of Vietnam, uh, a, ga a ghastly, god-awful conflict that should never have happened and should have been ended a long time before it was, and from which both Vietnam and America are still recovering 50-plus years 
later. Anyway, so just as a for instance, I'm walking around today singing uh, the hunting song by Tom Lehrer, of which um, the, uh, the the bridge is, uh, it's about, you know, somebody going out to be a hunter and the bridge is, um, people ask me how I, how I do it. And I say, there's nothing to it. You just stand there looking cute. And when something moves, you shoot. And then of course the chorus, which all people who know Tom Lehrer will know is there's 10 stuffed heads in my trophy room right now, two game wardens, seven hunters, whoops, seven, and a full bred Guernsey cow. Um, and, uh, it, it just, he was very dark, very dark, very funny, very cynical. And I'd love to do an entire broadcast on Tom Lair and, and what his life was like and stuff like that and share some of his stuff with people that will require a level of involvement with the production end that I have not been prepared to do in the last year because of just craziness. But that and talking about other people, writers, especially that I love, you know, music, old television shows and movies that many people may not know, you know, just in large part because there's a generational difference. Now, everything is now available on the internet or virtually everything. But, you know, there are huge, huge uh, gaps between what is commonly shown to people or what people are commonly exposed to and all the other stuff that's there. But you have to know, you have to go looking for it. If you're into obscure this or that, you can find it. But if you don't know what to look for, the chances that you're going to find it are, are slim. So, I mean, I'll take somebody very well known uh, in our field, like Roger Zelazny, a writer. Um, and, you know, Zelazny was huge in the, in the 70s, at late 60s and 70s, you know, and was writing amazing stuff. Now, there are people who are science fiction fans today who are still reading him, but he is not anywhere near as well known as he should be. And he wrote some amazing stuff. Um, big influence on me wanting to, not so much wanting to write, because I was already kind of moving in the storytelling direction, but certainly a big influence on me wanting to write science fiction and fantasy, because he was one of those people that I've often talked about who kind of wove back in and out through science and fantasy. Um, the, neither the science nor the fantasy parts were ever so important that he would put himself in a rigid box of any kind. He just wrote the stories he wanted to write and let them figure out what they were afterward, you know, and let the audiences do the same. So there's a lot of stuff like that that I would like to share just because I love it and I want to make sure it gets passed on to other people who would also love it, you know, I mean... You know, there's a lot of people out there who don't really know the Bonzo Dog Band. They know about Monty Python and they get why Monty Python was great. They don't know the Bonzo Dog Band. There's a lot of people out there. Um, I was talking last night when I was doing the reading about um, a gentleman who does a, a very good podcast called Library Ladder. I've gone blank on his name. Um, but who did a, he did one on me and he did one on, uh, I think it was the best, greatest living fantasy author for whom he named Guy K, Guy Gabriel K, which is fine with me in the sense that I think Guy K is a wonderful writer and I love to see him get attention. Part of the problem is, of course, is that he's Canadian, so he's better known in Canada than in America, which is crazy in this day and age. But, you know, the fact is, is that I didn't agree with that. And I thought, how can you say that when Michael Moorcock is still alive? Michael Moorcock is, you know, has been a giant of the field since the 1960s. Um, and as good as Guy K is, or I like to think I am, or any number of other good contemporary fantasy writers, um, I don't think any of us me measure up to the career of Michael Moorcock. Um, and I would have said this long before I ever met Mike. This is not a personal thing at all. I mean, just he's incredibly important in our field. He kind of single-handedly created, not created, but he single-handedly, no, not single-handedly. He was a major part of the surge to a new form of science fiction um, in the 1970s. And, you know, just wrote everything from kind of more serious literary novels to wonderful sword and sorcery, Elric of Mel Nubine and all this kind of stuff. Um, just all over the shop, could do anything, can do anything. Mike is still with us, I'm glad to say. Um, and so, you know, that there's, there's that kind of stuff that I want to share with people who might not know where to start or might not know, well, what would I like? Or, you know, is this for me? 
So that's kind of part of what I would like to do when we finish up with these and maybe with reading one more. As I said, I think I might read um, Brothers of the Wind because it would be a rest because <laughs> I wouldn't have to do all the voices because it's all in the, in the uh, voice of one character. So that would be fun. Um, anyway, what else to tell you? So, okay, so for those who didn't, haven't yet heard or didn't tune in for the reading last night, we have finished most of the moving. We have finished much of the heavy lifting, although, as I discovered today, we still have many boxes stacked up in the backyard under tarps, which we're going to have to do something about at some point. And, and there's still things. Um, my, my beloved wife upbraided me, probably with, with great justification for my walking around the house grumping about not being able to find things. Um, and it, it is, you know, it's the kind of thing that... Uh, detail-oriented people like me have particular troubles with. Not, not, not that we expect everything to work all the time, but you know, you spend years at least knowing where the crucial things are. Whether they look like they're organized to anybody else is not the same thing, but knowing where they are in the disorganization, if that's how it works. And as a result, you know, we're, we, we've been in chaos for a couple of months at least because of packing everything up on one end and remodeling the house and the old house and, you know, unpacking here or trying to and having to deal with it in, in triage mode where you just do what you have to. So if you need to cook, you find a pan <laughs> or a pot or whatever. And if all the rest of the pans and pots are with it, excellent. You know, you're doing well. Chances are, though, it's like somebody saw it at the last moment, threw it in a box with, you know, the stapler and, and uh, you know, a, a bunch of socks that had been in a drawer that somebody missed the first time through. And so there's these crazy random things all over the place. So that's where we are. And, and you know, Deb's right, I'm sure. I'm sure I do get grumpy about it sometimes. And, and uh, being the person that I am, instead of punching things or kicking things or whatever, when I'm grumpy about something, I just walk around making grumpy remarks much the same way I might when somebody cuts me off in traffic, you know, just like, <laughs> so I, I'm sorry for my family to have to put up with that. <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm all about trying to go forward with not just my book writing work, but you know, just stuff like getting the house running. And when you have an idea and you go, okay, if I grab this now, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. And then it'll be ready for such and such that we need. And then, you suddenly realize this could be anywhere within a 50 mile radius, this thing I'm looking for. I mean, literally, literally, it may be in a, a storage shed somewhere. It may be, you know, in the garage at the old house where we still have a lot of stuff stored. It could be here somewhere in a box in the backyard, which are piled eight, eight high in a big row that looks not unlike the walls of uh, Jericho or something. So we pray they will not come tumbling down. Um, and uh, as a result, you know, your, what, your forward impulses are suddenly stymied. And you're just like, well, I guess I'm going to, instead of doing this thing or two things or whatever that I was going to do with the widget I was looking for, I will now spend an hour instead trying to find the widget. So anyway, that's, that's how life is. Y'all know this. I'm not telling anybody um, you know, I'm not telling anybody anything that they don't know already if they've moved. Um, big events, whether they are things like weddings or, you know, um, big anniversary parties or baby gender reveals. Oh, my God. Um, or, you know, whatever they may happen to be, book launches um, and moving. You know, it, they're always going to be twice as much difficulty as you think they are. And I, 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 I have learned this. I, I do not say this lightly. They are going to be twice as much, no matter how, what you estimate, no matter how careful you are to uh, provide for every alternative possibility and every weird little thing that might go wrong. You are so far off. It's going to be twice as difficult as you think it is. And there's going to be twice as many things that are going to go off the rails. So Embrace the chaos as best you can. That's my philosophy. If you have to grumble, grumble. Yeah, that's my philosophy too. But, you know, just get used to it because that's life. And all the grumbling in the world won't make it go away. Anyway, so what else did I want to talk about before I start reading? Was there anything else? 
Now that's basically it. Everybody is fine here. Um, we have the same dog, dogs, um, Walter and Johnny. Um, they're both a little nervous and beset. Johnny in particular does not like change and he's a nervous dog anyway. Um, Walter is now mostly deaf and as a result he's constantly violating Johnny's space boundaries. The cat is living in another room, so that's why you don't see a cat behind me. She's fine, though. Um, and uh, Deb is working away. Um, our two young people are doing whatever it is they do, because we only see them when they emerge from behind their bedroom doors. And life is pretty lifelike, so no complaints here. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Let me check and make sure, actually, that I've got... Why does this say the live video has ended? Oh, yes, Medardo, my friend Medardo, Medardo uh, points out that Peter Beagle and Tim Powers are still alive too, happily. Yes, absolutely. And both people I like very much and whose work I have enjoyed tremendously over the years. Um, I have no idea why this says the live video has ended. If anybody can tell me, I don't think that's true because nobody has posted anything to say otherwise um, but please let me know if there is as usual of course the comments are incomprehensible yeah Tracy says it's lying so um, okay good glad to hear it I'm gonna quickly see check and see who's here in the comments if I can do that that might be asking too much um, let's see if we can get another window open on that page Okay, and 33 comments. Okay, so I'm just going to say hello to the people who I've got here. Um, all right, so I've got Anna. Hello, Anna. That's Anna Branscombe. Barb Ann. Hello, Barb Ann. Claudia, good to see you too. Jose, a pleasure, sir. Dean, that's a, that's a, a fairly recent name. Dean Wild. Hello, Dean. Tracy, thank you for the... Uh, the, the uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Feedback. Hello. Thank you for the feedback. Um, who else? Steve Gurr. Good to see you. Tim Speckens, as always a pleasure. Medardo, I have already mentioned, but as always also a pleasure. Jeremy, my friend Jeremy, who now that we've moved over the hill, Jeremy is only a mile or so from where I sit right now. Kristen, and Kristen's also in this area too. Ron, hello Ron. Ron, you're going to be uh, glad to know that I'm still working on the book <laughs> I haven't given up or anything we're, we're doing okay and I'm paying attention to everything that you folks told me so that doesn't mean everything will be solved to your complete satisfaction in the manuscript but it means I have certainly not discarded any suggestions I am paying attention to all of them who else checked in Kelly hello Kelly good to see you Isaac as always, good to see Isaac too. Ray Weatherford checking in. Joanna McCallum, who is checking in from the uh, UK. Susan Shamblin and Penny Davies. So those are the ones that I have listed here. Let me see if there's anybody else I'm mentioning. Uh, yeah, for some reason, this thing just does never wants to show me more than a couple of comments at a time. I don't know what the hell that's about. But I'm not going to worry about it too much. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to start reading. And as I said, we're going to finish. And then if we finish early, I'll say a few more things. And then we'll probably wrap it up and I'll go eat pizza. Um, because that's what we do on Sunday around here when I'm doing readings is uh, we order pizza. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it came like a half an hour ago. So um, it, it's, I will be eating it reheated. But that's okay. My entire life is about reheating things. That's why I became a writer, because we are professional prestidigitators, uh, pickpockets. You know, we take all the ideas that we inhaled growing up and uh, that we fell in love with, and we refit them, and we recalibrate them, and occasionally we even come up with some new ones of our own, and then we put them back together into something and pass them along. And that's really all I'm about. There's, okay, last thought. This is a famous, famous story within the science fiction community. So if you're already part of the science fiction community, you have undoubtedly heard this. Um, and, but the, uh, 
The story was that in the early part of his career, Jerry Pornell, a man with whom I had many political arguments, but, but uh, have nothing against personally at all and, and know that he's done some very great work in the field. Um, Jerry Pornell, when he was starting out, had a lot of help from Robert Heinlein. Robert Heinlein, one of the deans of science fiction writing um, in, in history, really. I mean, one of the five or six most important science fiction writers, certainly of his time. And Heinlein gave Pornell a lot of help getting started. And once Pornell's career was up and working and he was selling books and, you know, doing stuff like that, um, he, the story goes that he went back to Robert Heinlein uh, and said, you know, you, your, your help has meant so much to me. Um, how can I pay you back? And reputedly, Heinlein said to him, you don't pay it back. You pay it forward. And I'm a huge believer in that in all kinds of ways. You know, if people are kind to you in your life, yeah, obviously thank them and treat them well, but they're not being kind to you because they want something back. They are usually, the, the ones who are, that are meaningful, the ones who are meaningful to me are being kind to contribute to the betterment of human life. And as a result, they're probably, if they're able to help you, um, they probably don't need your help when you are established. What they would like to see you do, and this has always been Deb's and my aim in life, is you pay it forward. You pay it on to other people. If people were kind to you or helpful to you, you do it for others. And while that's very much a, a goal for us in terms of politically, financially, all those ways, it's also kind of what I think about with my writing career. It gives me a chance to share things with people, things that I loved that were meaningful to me, you know, um, in some very obvious ways, like when somebody contacts me to write an introduction to some books that I really loved, say, for instance, which I've done for Michael Moorcock and Philip K. Dick and Mervyn Peake's Gormenghast series. Um, you know, there's a chance to show things to a new generation or a new audience and that's one way but i think in general storytelling is about that you take the things that influenced you and that you loved and you try to find a way to make them different enough that they're worth passing on without simply just passing on the same original thing if that makes sense anyway okay enough bibble babble i am going to start reading let me find there we go okay so last time, um, that's meaning last night, when I was reading, we got to the part where uh, we had just gotten through the big climax when I had to move house. So um, the giant fungus monster, the brain controlling fungus monster that had a hold of Gideon, the farm's owner, um, has been defeated by lightning bolt and uh, wire and a fence post metal fence post and um tyler has pulled the woman grace he was chasing all this time out of the washstand mirror and is hiding her in lucinda's room until gideon is well enough to be told that his wife has been found and um now everybody is worried about the long-term prospects for ordinary farm and what mrs needle is going to do who had been essentially caught red-handed trying to manipulate Gideon into signing over the farm to her and her son, Colin. And even Colin has begun to realize that his mother is a serious danger to human life and everything else. So anyway, so Lucinda is on her way to talk to her brother, Tyler, about some of these issues. And that's where we are. It was a slightly weird scene upstairs in what had been Lucinda's room until the night of the storm. Grace was sitting on the bed with Ula kneeling behind her, brushing Grace's thin white hair. The Ice Age girl, after a lifetime of bare grease and tangles, had taken to clean hair and brushes with joy and would sit for hours happily tending the hair of the other women. Lucinda had been amused at how many times Ula had asked Tyler to let her brush his hair as well, and how adamantly her brother had always refused. Tyler was pacing back and forth in the middle of the room, like the producer of a Broadway show just before opening night. What is it? he asked. Is Gideon up yet? 
Lucinda could only shake her head. Why are you making such a fuss of this? Why have you kept it a secret from Gideon? Oops. Hang on. Oh, yeah, I've got to do that, don't I? Because he's been unconscious most of the time. Duh. Grace had looked up at the mention of Gideon's name, her eyes mild and slightly anxious. Do I know you? she asked Lucinda. Yes. It was hard to connect this frail, blinking creature with the beautiful, bright young woman in all the old photos. I I'm Tyler's sister. This is my room, remember? Gideon's our great uncle. She turned to her brother. We should have taken her to a hospital, Tyler. There's something wrong with her. Nothing that seeing Gideon again won't fix, he said stubbornly. Gideon? Grace shook her head. Will he, he, will he be mad at me for coming back? Are you kidding? Tyler said. He'll be thrilled. Lucinda was not so certain. Mad at her for coming back? What did that mean? But before she could ask any more questions, Azinza appeared at the door. The young African woman had put on her best dress, a wrap of cotton cloth in bright browns, yellows, and reds that draped her long slender form all the way to the floor. She really did look like some kind of royalty. He is ready for us, she announced. Come down. Tyler turned to Ula, who was making a last few adjustments to Grace's hair. You wait with her at the top of the stairs. I'll call you when it's time. Understand? Ula nodded at this great responsibility with a solemn, almost worshipful expression. Lucinda liked the cave girl just fine, but she thought that someone who listened to her brother that seriously had to be a bad influence on him. Sometimes, Ula acted as though Tyler had showed up in the Ice Age on purpose just to rescue her, instead of by messing around with something he should have left alone, which was what had actually happened. She felt a moment of regret for this hard thought as she went down the stairs. Yeah, but if he hadn't done something stupid, then Ula would probably have been eaten by that bear. Just please don't do anything too dramatic and embarrassing, she begged Tyler quietly as they reached the bottom of the stairs. The rest of the farm folk were filing into the entry hall, murmuring quietly among themselves. He gave her an irritated look. You'll be thanking me when this is all over. Just watch. You'll be calling me Mr. Genius Dude. If you say so. She was too worried even to tell him what an idiot he was sometimes. The snake parlor was a good-sized room, but it would have been crowded just with all the farm folk in it. With Gideon's bed taking up the center of the room, it felt like she was elbow to elbow with the other passengers on a crowded train, and it reminded her how soon she and Tyler would be on their way back home again. Both Gideon and Mr. Walkwell were sitting up, although for once Lucinda thought she might have picked her great uncle in a race or even a wrestling contest between the two of them. Simos Walkwell looked weirdly pale and frail, while Gideon although not at his strongest, was obviously healthier than he'd been for weeks. As usual, his hair stuck up in unruly wisps. It was clear that another of Caesar's attempts to tame it with a comb and water had already failed. Uncle Gideon, it's good to see you, Lucinda told him, and she meant it. From the expression of his eyes and face, she was pretty sure they had the old Gideon back. I'm glad you're feeling better. He nodded and smiled at her, but he was listening to something Ragnar was telling him. When he did lean away from the big man, it was to wave to the three amigos who had stopped in the doorway and stood shyly, their hats in their hands. "'Please come in,' Gideon told the herders, and his voice was so mild that for a moment Lucinda was frightened that she might have been wrong, that her great-uncle might still be some kind of brainwashing victim. Then Gideon frowned and waved emphatically. For heaven's sake, he said in an irritated tone, I said come in already. Lucinda was relieved. The nervous Mongolian scuttled forward and squeezed in behind Ragnar and Haneb and the kitchen women. As she went past him, Lucinda stopped beside Simos Walkwell. 
How are you? she asked. I, I came to see you yesterday, but you were sleeping. The ancient fawn looked at her with weary eyes. Even the stubs of his horns seemed dull. That thing had me for a long time, he said slowly. Like you, I breathed its poison seeds, but I breathed them for nearly an hour. I saw terrible things. He shook his head. A world where that demon was the only living thing left on the earth. I dreamed that it was reaching up to conquer the heavens themselves. Mr. Walkwell trailed off, then lifted an unsteady brown hand to pat her on the arm. It was strange and disturbing for Lucinda to see, this, to see him this way. Forgive me, child. It is a long time since I have been brought so low. Go and sit. There is much to discuss today. All the farm's inhabitants seemed to be present now, even Colin and his mother, who had come in last and arranged themselves at the foot of Gideon's bed, where they stood with stony faces like mourners at a funeral. Well, Gideon said, it's a pleasure to see you all. More of a pleasure than you can guess, he smiled as if at a private joke. There have been times in the last few weeks when I didn't think this would ever happen again. You, me, all of us here together on the farm. Needless to say, I am grateful for the extra work you all did during my illness. But I am even more conscious that much of the confusion was my own fault. He nodded his head. Yes, my fault. I am an old man and I hold the safety and happiness of many people, good people, in my hands. You people, I cannot afford to be so careless. Lucinda was impressed. Was Gideon actually going to admit for once that he might not have all the answers? But that still wouldn't solve the farm's worst problems. She snuck a glance at Mrs. Needle, the farm's most dangerous problem, as far as Lucinda was concerned, and caught Colin looking back at her with an odd, unreadable expression on his face. When he met Lucinda's eyes, he quickly dropped his gaze. So... What I wanted to tell you, Gideon went on, is that I'm going to make things a lot clearer about what happens if I'm not around. No, let's be honest, when I'm not around, because I won't live forever. Don't say this. Sarah, the cook, crossed herself vigorously. She sounded genuinely frightened, and little Pema looked as though she might burst into tears. Gideon laughed. Come, come, my dears, we all die someday, and we all have a responsibility to be ready for whatever changes will come. After all, if it weren't for you, and patience nursing me so ably over these last weeks, I might not have been here today to give you this little speech. He chuckled, but the rest of the farm folk looked at each other or glanced quickly at Mrs. Needle. No, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking the last few days about all of this, Gideon went on. Lucinda and Tyler, would you come here, please? Her brother jumped like he'd been pinched. What, us? Just go, Lucinda whispered. She grabbed his elbow and pushed him toward Gideon's bedside. Their great-uncle smiled at them like a weary department store Santa Claus with his last two clients of the day. Caesar, help me sit up a little, will you? When the pillows had been plumped again behind him, Gideon nodded. Better. Thank you. Ah, you too, he said to Tyler and Lucinda. How you've shaken this old place up. It wasn't very long ago that I was wishing I'd never brought you here. But that's not the way I feel anymore. A place like this needs more than just a legal owner. It needs to, to belong to someone who cares about it, who loves it. 
I think I know the answer, but I want to hear it for myself. Do you two really love Ordinary Farm? Yes, said Tyler, so quickly and so loud that Gideon jumped a little. Yes, Uncle Gideon, of course. We really, really do. Lucinda thought of angry Desta and what she'd had to do to that poor little dragon to protect the farm. More even than you know. That's what I wanted to hear. Gideon reached up a shaky hand to glass clasp Tyler's hand, then Lucinda's. It frightened her how fragile his bones felt beneath the skin. And here's what I want to say. I am going to make a new will. I, I haven't changed the terms of my old one since my wife's, my wife's disappearance. Lucinda couldn't help looking right at the needles. Colin still wouldn't meet her gaze, but Mrs. Needle stared back as if daring Lucinda to say something. Didn't Gideon know that the witch had been trying to change his will only a few nights ago? Why hadn't Ragnar or someone else told Gideon about that? Did they expect her and Tyler to do it? You see, Gideon continued, I understand now that it's not just my farm. It belongs to everyone in this room. In fact, most of you have nowhere else to go. Hey, hey, none of you came here by choice. Not exactly. And without the farm, your existence here in this world, this time, would be difficult, maybe even impossible. Not to mention all of our animals that can only survive here, where we've learned how to take care of them. So here is what I'm going to do. After much thought, I am making Lucinda and Tyler my heirs. When I'm gone, Ordinary Farm will belong to the two of you. But only if you agree to abide by my terms and honor all the responsibilities that go with it. Even in the midst of such an amazing moment, something about what he said nagged at her. Responsibilities? Lucinda asked. Like feeding the animals? Of course, we'll take care of them just like you have, Uncle Gideon. We know all about that. Not quite. The old man held up his hand to hold back more questions. No, part of what it means to own Ordinary Farm is to protect Ordinary Farm and all the people on it. If you agree to be my heirs, you must also solemnly promise me that everyone here will always have a home at Ordinary Farm. Everyone? asked Lucinda. No matter what they do, even if they try to brainwash or kill people? She wondered. How could she and Tyler promise to let Patience Needle stay when they already knew she would go to any length to take the farm for herself and Colin? Um, um, Tyler was fidgeting like someone who needed to use the bathroom. It was clear he was feeling a painful need to share his own secret. Lucinda hoped he'd keep his mouth shut about Grace until they could find out whether Gideon really meant what he'd just said. You mean, even if we're in charge someday, we can't ever kick out anybody here? She avoided looking at Patience Needle, but everyone in the room except Gideon knew who she was talking about. No matter what they do? We can't say yes to that, Uncle Gideon. Come, come he said, frowning. I I'm not asking you to do anything I haven't done myself. It's, it's simple, child. Do you promise to abide by my rules? His displeasure turned to surprise. Tyler, what are you doing? Where is he going? Come back here. But her brother was already slipping between the three amigos, hurrying out of the parlor. Once again, Lucinda wished Tyler would think before he acted. Now she had only a few moments before he showed up with Grace, and that would probably be the end of any real conversation for the day. I'm very unhappy with your brother's irresponsible behavior, Gideon said. And 
speaking of irresponsible, what on earth are you trying to say? I'm offering you an amazing gift. Nothing like it has ever existed before. Why can't you just do as I ask? She cleared her throat. We're really grateful, Uncle Gideon. It's just that some of us feel that not everyone here on Ordinary Farm has your best interests, the farm's best interests. She turned to Ragnar, Sarah, and the kitchen women. Isn't anyone else going to talk? Hasn't anyone told him anything? But before another word could be said, Tyler burst through the doorway, leading his surprise. She was dressed in a simple dress from 20 years or more gone, and her hair was brushed and shiny. Look, Uncle Gideon, Tyler said, half tugging her toward the old man's bedside. Just look who we found for you while you were sick. Look who's here. It's Grace. Gideon looked at her, his face slack with confusion and growing wonder. Then it somehow slid right past wonder and back into pure confusion. What? Who is this? It's Grace, Uncle Gideon. Tyler was almost jumping up and down in his worried excitement. Your wife! Gideon stared at the woman for a long moment, then turned to Tyler. What are you talking about? That isn't Grace. Tyler was clearly getting panicky now. Just, just look at her again, Uncle Gideon. It's been 20 years, and she was stuck in a real bad place. But it's her. Gideon looked at the white-haired woman again, who seemed nervous just returning his gaze, blinking and leaning away from him. He shook his head. No, not my grace. Tyler turned to Ragnar and the rest. Maybe he doesn't recognize her because he's been sick. No, Gideon speaks the truth, said Mr. Walkwell from the couch. I am the other only person here who knew her. He shook his head wearily. That is not Grace Goldring. Chapter 44, The Price of Peace If Colin Needle hadn't been in such a miserable mood, he would have taken a great deal of pleasure from the expressions on Tyler Jenkins' face as it became clear that no amount of insisting on his part was going to turn this confused old woman into Gideon's long-lost wife, Grace. Even better than that, the younger Jenkins had completely distracted everyone just when Lucinda had been about to tell Gideon about the things Patience Needle had done. Colin might have his own doubts about his mother, but he couldn't imagine anything good could come from her being denounced in front of everybody. Still, the danger was by no means gone, just delayed, and Colin could sense something behind his mother's carefully composed features that he'd hardly ever seen in her before, a shadow of distress or even fear. Oops, hang on just a second. This new realization struck Colin like a blow. His mother didn't know what was going to happen next. The situation here was actually beyond her control. He had never imagined such a day might come, and he didn't know whether to be excited or terrified. But... If this lady's not Grace, Lucinda suddenly asked, bringing a little quiet to the noisy room, then who is she? While everyone else had been arguing, Gideon had been staring at the newcomer. Now he blinked and sat up straighter in his bed. My goodness, he said, I've just realized. I think it's Dorothea. She used to live here with us. Dorothea, is that you? Dorothea? asked Tyler, as deflated as Colin Needle could ever hope to see him. Who the heck is Dorothea? Grace's cousin, Dorothea Pence. But she left and moved back east years ago. What's she doing here? Gideon leaned toward the woman. Dorothea, is that really you? 
She at first only looked confused, but at last she nodded. Dorothea? Yes, that's my name. I, I had forgotten. But where did she come from? Gideon demanded. Did she just wander onto the property? Dorothea, when did you come back? He turned to Mr. Walkwell. Simos, do you know anything about this? Uh, no, no, you've been sick too. Ragnar? The Norseman spread his hands. Tyler found her. As he said, he brought her back. Tyler? Gideon's voice had an edge now. And you brought me Grace's necklace, too, didn't you? Told me you found it in the library. Well, you'd better tell me everything. And this time I want the whole truth, boy. I... but I don't... Tyler hesitated, then looked at his great-uncle in a pleading way. Really? Sweat dripped down the back of Colin Needle's neck. His guts felt heavy, and it was all he could do not to look over at his mother. If Tyler Jenkins started talking, who was to say where he'd stop? Did anybody in this room really want Gideon Goldring to know the whole truth? The mirror on the washstand? Gideon seemed astonished. The antique washstand? It was in the library in Octavio's retiring room? That mirror? He turned to Mr. Walkwell. What do you think of that, Simus? Strange, eh? Mr. Walkwell was sitting up on his makeshift bed, paying close attention to everything being said, but he didn't reply. And it's upstairs now? Gideon asked, his voice stern again as he turned to Mrs. Needle. In your room, Patience. Is that true? What's it doing there? The housekeeper spoke slowly and precisely as if she had started considering her answer long before Gideon asked the question. I thought it seemed an unusual, interesting piece of furniture. Too nice to be hidden away. I had it brought to my office because... Well, because I liked it, she nodded. Isn't that right, Colin? Colin nodded, too. He felt as though everything was balanced on a knife's edge, that things could still go back to the way they were, but could just as easily tumble over into something completely unknown and unpredictable. And so that's where the locket came from, too. Gideon had taken it from his neck and held it draped across the palm of his hand. I remember now. Grace gave it to Dorothea when she left for Providence. He turned towards he turned toward Dorothea, who was sitting on a chair beside his bed. When did you come back from the East Coast? The woman shook her head. I I never left. I got to Los Angeles, but I couldn't bear to leave Grace behind. She seemed so downhearted. So I called the people I was going to stay with in Providence and told them I'd changed my mind. Then I took the train back to Standard Valley. I didn't tell anyone I was coming until I got there because, well, because I thought you might be upset, Gideon. Uncle Octavio drove out to pick me up. I was worried because he was getting along in years, but he got us back to the farm with no problems. She trailed off, staring at her water glass. But I don't remember what happened after that. She looked up, and now it was clear to Colin and everyone else how upset she was, her eyes red-rimmed, her expression almost haunted. I don't remember anything except nightmares. Tears began to roll down her cheek. Oh, but what's happened to me? Why am I so old? Gideon waved his hand. He looked uncomfortable. Uh, there, there, dear, you're safe. Now we'll explain everything soon. He looked around a little desperately. Dorothea's still tired, I think. Uh, she, she may think of more when she's recovered. Sarah, why don't you take her back to her room? I do it, said Ula, jumping to her feet. 
She led Dorothea out of the steak parlor. In the quiet that followed their departure, Gideon turned back to Tyler Jenkins. Why did you lie to me, boy? About my wife, of all things. He crossed his arms over his chest and glared. About my wife. As happy as Colin was to see his enemy get a tongue lashing, he was worried about what Tyler might say. A moment later, his worries were confirmed. Why? I had to, Uncle Gideon. Everybody lies to you. Most of the people in the room sucked in their breath at the same time. Last year? This year? Everybody? Tyler smacked his hands together in frustration. People try to let you know what's going on around here, but you never want to hear it. That's nonsense. Gideon's face darkened. Are you saying you tried to tell me that the mirror from the library was some kind of miniature fault line, but that I wouldn't listen? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Tyler turned to his sister. It's way more than the mirror. Luce, help me out. Tell him about the witch. Tell him what Mrs. Needle did to him. Now Lucinda Jenkins stepped out beside her brother. Colin felt dizzy and sick, but he did nothing to stop either of them, as though he was in one of those dreams where he couldn't make words come out of his mouth. He's telling the truth, Uncle Gideon, Lucinda said. Can't you remember anything that happened to you? Mrs. Needle nearly killed you. She's been trying to take the farm away from you. And last summer, she almost killed Tyler. She hadn't even finished before Colin's mother stepped forward, her face white and her brows like slashes of ink. She pointed a trembling hand at Lucinda, and the girl shied back as if it were a gun. How? How dare you? She spat at the girl, then whirled to face Gideon. These children have treated me dreadfully since they first came. But this, this is utter madness. Tried to kill you, they claim. Me, who went nights on end without sleep to nurse you during your illness, as anyone else in the house will confirm. But you caused his illness. Lucinda Jenkins was clearly frightened of his mother, but Colin could see she would not give up so easily. For a moment, he forgot all his own fears and a sort of fever of ad admiration, but only for a moment. Everybody knows what you do, Mrs. Needle. She tried to kill you with a fungus, Uncle Gideon, shouted Tyler. And she, she sent this, this devil squirrel thing after me last year. Lucinda turned to the other farm folk, but many of them actually shrank back from her, as though she might grab them and drag them into the fight. What's wrong with you all? Isn't anybody going to speak up but Tyler and me? Sarah's plump face was red and her eyes teary, but a determined expression was hardening her features. She opened her mouth as if to speak, but Mrs. Needle turned and glared at her so fiercely that the cook snapped it shut again. Do you really credit any of this? Colin's mother demanded, turning back to Gideon. Do you hear the nonsense these children spout? Of course the boy would take his sister's side. Of course he would swear to the truth of her demented tales. Did you hear him? Poison fungus, devil squirrels. She was breathing so hard in her fury, and, yes, in her fear, that Colin had a sudden picture in his head of his mother tied to a stake surrounded by jeering peasants. Will you sit there and let them call me a witch when you know that I have done nothing that was not done by your own orders? Now it was Gideon who looked caught between two enemies. Now, patience, he said. I'm sure the children are exaggerating. It's a misunderstanding, that's all. No, Gideon, the deep voice surprised everyone. The children are not exaggerating. Ragnar stepped forward. Will you listen to me? Does my word mean something to you? Gideon gaped at him. Ragnar? And I must speak to Gideon, said Mr. Walkwell from his couch. The children are right. The woman is a poison, Gideon. 
She means us all harm. She wants everything for herself. Liars! Colin didn't even realize until everyone turned toward him that it was his own voice, screaming. Don't! She's not! And then he turned and stumbled from the room, uncertain at first where he was going, except that he had to get away from those accusing faces, away from his mother as she was slowly surrounded like a cat treed by a pack of baying hounds. Colin! His mother's voice was piercing. Colin, where are you going? Come back here! But he suddenly knew what he had to do. He hurried toward the stairs that led up to his room. Less than a minute later, his backpack now clutched against his chest. Colin jumped down the last few stairs and shoved his way into the snake parlor. People were shouting. Even his mother, who seldom raised her voice, even in the grimmest circumstances. You have had too many chances already, witch! Ragnar bellowed, his voice loud enough to drive nails. Close your mouth, you Norse peasant! His mother cried. Peasant? Ragnar's voice became, if possible, even louder. I was a king! Stop! Someone shouted in a ringing voice. Gideon had thrown back the covers. Gideon had thrown back the covers and put his feet on the floor and was now lifting himself up to a standing position with some help from Caesar. Stop! All of you! I won't have this kind of behavior in my house! He turned and saw Colin in the doorway. There wasn't much kindness in the old man's face. It's a good thing you came back, boy, because clearly we all have a lot to talk about. A lot of serious, serious things to talk about. Colin's heart now felt as stone heavy as the rest of his innards. He could tell by the look on Gideon's face that there would be no turning back to the way things were, no sweeping this under the rug. Colin pawed at the strap on his backpack, trying to get out the continuous scope. H hold on, Gideon. Hold on. I have something to show you. The old man wasn't having it. No, I said I wanted to talk, boy. I want answers. No, you need to see this. He couldn't get the buckle open. My, my mother figured out where this was. She sent me out to get it. No way! No way, screamed Tyler Jenkins, rushing forward. He grabbed the backpack and tried to yank it from Colin's hand. You total liar! You followed me! I found it! Tyler! Colin! Oh, for goodness sake, said Gideon, for the moment more irritated than furious. Will someone just stop these two in their cursed wrangling? I need people to start talking sense around here. Ragnar! But even as the big Norseman stepped up and reached for the backpack that held the continuous scope, his hand so big and his arm so strong that Colin knew he could take it away easily, even if Colin held on with both of his own, Gideon Goldring made a strange noise. Ragnar stopped, staring, the backpack forgotten for the moment. Everybody else in the room was staring, too. Gideon Goldring had opened his mouth to say something else, but nothing came out but a weird rasping. He tried to suck in more air and only made a horrible thwarted noise in his throat. Gideon opened his mouth wide now as if to scream, but still nothing would come. He turned bright red, and his face began to darken into an even more frightening color, gray-blue as a bruise, and he suddenly crumpled to the floor. Oh no! Lucinda Jenkins shouted over the cries of the others in the room. He's having a heart attack! We have to get him to a hospital. Ragnar let go of Colin's backpack and in, a mo and in a moment was kneeling by Gideon's side. The old man was still struggling, but his movements were growing weaker every moment. He kicked his legs feebly, bending and straightening like a fish yanked from the water. He can't get his breath, Tyler shouted. Call an ambulance. It'll take forever for them to get out here, said Lucinda, her face white with shock and horror. Is there a... A helicopter or something? A medical helicopter? Ragnar, take him, cried Simos Walkwell from his couch. Take him in that terrible machine and drive him to the town, swiftly. If he's having a heart attack, Tyler said, he needs help now. We should take him over to the Carrillos. Suddenly, Mrs. Needle was standing beside Ragnar and Gideon, 
whose hands and heads were the only things whose hands and head were the only thing that still moved, although it was little more than twitching. It is not his heart, you fools, she said in a voice hard and clear as glass, and the cure is very simple. What are you talking about, witch? Ragnar looked as though he would be happy to tear her head off with his bare hands. Quiet, Norseman. Get back, and I will help him. When Ragnar didn't move, she stared at him, then looked around the room. Fools! Do you really want Gideon to die instead of letting me cure him? Mrs. Walk Mr. Walkwell's voice cut through the sudden hush. Let her try to heal him, Ragnar. You go and bring the car around to the front door. Mrs. Needle smirked. No car will be needed. She reached into the pocket of her apron and pulled out a tiny glass vial as black as her skirt. She unstopped it, then let a couple of drops fall into Gideon's open, gasping mouth. What are you doing to him? Lucinda demanded, but Colin's mother ignored her, staring at Gideon as though the old man lying on the floor fighting for breath was the most interesting thing she had ever seen. Colin clutched his backpack tight, suddenly more frightened than he'd ever been in his life. A moment later, the agonized stretched line of Gideon Goldring's face, stretched lines of Gideon Goldring's face began to ease. The blood bruise color receded almost as quickly as it had come. And in a few moments, the harsh gaping, sorry, let me start that again. The blood bruise color receded almost as quickly as it had come. And a few moments later, the harsh gasping abruptly stopped as well. Gideon's mouth closed and then opened again so he could suck in a long draft of air. It very quickly became clear he was breathing easily again. God fiat prison, murmured Sarah. Praise to God. You poisoned him, Lucinda Jenkins accused Colin's mother, frightened and angry in equal measure. This time Colin didn't move or say anything because he had been thinking much the same thing himself. You poisoned him just so you could give him the antidote. Mrs. Needle actually smiled, though it was not a pleasant expression. By the way, I'm, I'm still working away over here, so um, I will let you guys know. Um, I, it, actually, I forgot there was another chapter after this, so we may go on for just a little while. Mrs. Needle actually smiled, although it was not a pleasant expression. Oh, nonsense, child. This is a problem Gideon developed this summer when he was recovering from his illness. You mean the fungus store spores that you dosed him with? Tyler demanded. That illness? Colin's mother kept her smile, but the rest of her face was as stiff as a mask. You really should learn to respect your elders, Tyler and Lucinda Jenkins. Your rudeness is going to get you into serious trouble some day. As Ragnar helped Gideon back to his bed, she turned slowly toward Mr. Walkwell, as if he were the judge for whom she was making her case. These children may spout any madness they please, but I'm sure you understand, Simos. You are Gideon's oldest friend here. You understand that he has this very serious condition that I and I alone have the medicine to cure or to keep it at bay entirely. So, which will it be, Simus? Would you have a needless war between us or will we all pull together to keep Gideon well and take care of this farm for the dear, dear Jenkins children who will inherit it some day? Her smile abruptly pulled into a line thin as a knife slash. If they live that long, of course. Life is uncertain, even in this brave new world. Mr. Walkwell stared at her, his face a study in sorrow, anger, and weariness. Don't do it, Tyler said, as if he sensed what was coming. We'll take Gideon to a hospital. Don't let her have her way. Nobody is having their way, child said Colin's mother, but she still kept her eyes fixed on Mr. Walkwell. We are making a compromise, doing what is best for all parties, and Gideon will agree, I promise you. She looked over to Gideon. 
He was conscious again, but like a frightened child, he did not look up to meet her gaze. Yes, dear, Gideon has always understood where his best interests lie. She lifted an eyebrow. Well, Seamus, is it to be peace between us? Ragnar stepped away from Gideon and stood over her, looking down with his hands knotted into broad fists. Each one of his arms looked almost as wide as Colin's slender mother. Just tell me what you wish, Simos, the Norseman said through clenched teeth. I will. I will stand by you. Mr. Walkwell slowly shook his head. I must think of Gideon and the farm, he said. So we will have peace. He looked from Colin's mother to Colin himself, and his eyes suddenly seemed so dark that Colin gasped. But remember we will have peace only as long as Gideon and these two children remain healthy. Mrs. Needle laughed. As you say, Simos, peace for now. Come along, Colin. Colin Needle had been about to give up the continuous scope to save his mother, but now he didn't even want to go with her. His prize was still hidden in the backpack, still his secret, safe from all others. He would hide it again, even from his mother. What else did he have that was truly his? Colin, I'm waiting. He didn't want to follow his mother, but he did, because that was what he had always done. But after today, how could anything ever be the same? He needed to think about that, Colin realized, as he trudged up the stairs. He needed to think about that very carefully. So, I freely admit I have miscalculated how long the last... Uh, I thought there was only one chapter, but there's uh, a, and a half left, but there was two and a half. However, the last chapter is very short. So, I'm going to read it right now and probably run another 20 minutes or so. And you all can either stick with me or watch it as a recording. So apologies for the confusion. Um, I assume everything is still happening over here. Okay, so, um, all right, so I'm still reading. Don't go away. Um, I'm assuming the video is still running as I still have the message that the live video has ended. I have no idea why, but it says the live video has ended just to piss me off. Um, let me know if there's uh, anything else I need to know. Um, okay, so I'm going to finish up. I'm going to read this last chapter. Hang on, let me back it up. Chapter 45, High as the Sky. Okay, I admit it, said Tyler as the horse pulled the wagon up the long driveway toward the Carrillo's house. I don't get exactly what happened yesterday. Did we win or, or did we lose? Ragnar snorted. He is changing his will for you. It is happening, and that is very fortunate for you. I know, I know, but didn't Mrs. Needle just get away with it again? Am I stupid or something? She's a witch. I thought that the bad guys were supposed to get punished. It's not that simple, Tyler, Lucinda began, although she had been worrying too. After yesterday's weird events in the snake parlor, the evening had been long and quiet, more like the gathering after a funeral than the festive time they had shared with the ordinary farm folk before their departure the previous year. But in one way, your brother is right, said Ragnar. His expression reminded Lucinda of the thunder clouds of last week. We have failed to dislodge that woman from Gideon's hearth. In that way, she has won. Because she poisoned Gideon, Lucinda said bitterly. Because she's blackmailing everyone. Yes, but she is like a serpent. She strikes best from cover, Ragnar told her. Now she must come out where all can see her. Don't fear, you two. Simos and I will no longer be silent. We will make sure the needlewoman never has so much power on the farm again or so much freedom. Yes, from now on, the fight will be in the open, and Gideon will not be able to hide his eyes behind his hand to avoid it. That made Lucinda feel a little better, but another thought occurred to her. 
as the door of the Carrillo's house swung open and Steve, Alma, and Carmen all crashed out into the front yard. But what if she tries to hurt you guys? Tyler and I won't be here. We won't even be able to help. Ragnar's big hand patted her back. I was a king, and Simos was counselor to several kings in his day. He grinned. We may smell like farmers, but there is more to both of us. Don't fear, child. We will not be caught by surprise again so easily. Time to go, Ragnar said after what seemed far too short a time at the Carrillo's house. No, don't, said Carmen, just a little longer. The train will be at the station in an hour, and the road is slow and muddy after all the rain, the big man said. You children know I am right. Are Mr. and Mrs. Carrillo still mad at Uncle Gideon? Lucinda asked. Ragnar shrugged. Gideon is himself again and understands he cannot ignore this matter any longer. I told them he has promised he will come here in a few days when he is strong enough. Together they will work out something. Gideon does not want to lose such good neighbors. His smile was gentle this time. You have too many fears, young Lucinda. Things are not perfect, but they will be better now. He gently shook the reins, and Culpepper clip-clopped toward the main road. Even Ragnar the Viking, big as he was, shrank quickly into the distance and vanished as the train pulled out of the Standard Valley station. But there was time for Lucinda to climb up on the seat and shout one last thing out the window at him. Don't make us wait until next summer to come back. We get holidays off school, you know. Whoa, said Tyler, plugging into his game boss. Everybody's staring loose. Maybe you should sort of chill out a little. To her embarrassment, he was right. Half the people in the passenger car had turned to look. She saw a conductor coming toward her and quickly slid down to a sitting position one, once more. The man in uniform frowned but continued past. Tyler was already deep into a game called Hamstromancy. Lucinda couldn't understand how he could just do that, disappear into some game as if he didn't have a care in the world. She settled back and closed her eyes, trying to calm herself enough to read or look at the scenery, but her thoughts were swirling in her head like startled birds, and they wouldn't stop. What was going to happen? If they were going to be the heirs of Ordinary Farm, wouldn't their mom have to know sooner or later? Would she come to the farm with them? What if mom totally freaked out? But what was bothering her most of all, Lucinda realized, was the strong feeling of unfinished business. There were still so many questions. You're not the only one who doesn't get it, she said to her brother. She must have spoken louder than she meant to because Tyler heard her even through his earbuds. Get what? he asked without looking up from his hamstering. I don't know. Take those off, will you? She waited. He grunted and paused his game. A lot of stuff, she said. What was that witch really trying to do to Gideon with that fungus? And why didn't I turn into a zombie, too? Was it just because I didn't get as much of it, this, that spore stuff as he did? Tyler looked at her in all innocence. Um, I think you meant to say, why didn't I turn into more of a zombie than I already am? She gave him a good hard shot on the leg to focus his thoughts. Cut it out. We know from the letter that the fungus came from near Madagascar. Didn't you tell me Octavio said something about Madagascar too? Yeah, he told me it's on the opposite side of the earth from the fault line here. Uh, that's why I think he said anyway that the two places were like the North and South Poles, but it was pretty scientific. He shook his head. Okay, giant Madagascar fault line fungus. I have a question too. How did Gideon get away from it? <coughs> Why was he wandering around on the 4th of July? I, I have a guess. 
Lucinda put a piece of tissue in her book to mark her place. When I was at the greenhouse that day, I got spored, I guess. Some of the metal of the greenhouse was melted. I think it must have got hit by lightning in that first storm. So? So that's almost for sure where Mrs. Needle was keeping Gideon. And then the lightning hit the place and then she shrugged. Then somehow it freaked out the fungus or something. Anyway, I think that's when he got out because there was that storm, remember? And then the next day was the fourth when we went to the Carrillos and Gideon suddenly showed up. Tyler nodded. Okay, sort of makes sense, but what about the other stuff? I know Colin's got the continuous scope. What if he starts messing with the fault line? She shrugged. There's nothing we can do about it right now. You warned Ragnar and Mr. Walkwell. They'll keep their eyes open. They said they'd find it if they could, or at least keep him out of the fault line. He scowled. That guy is such a creep. For once, Lucinda didn't bother arguing. And the mirror, the washstand mirror, she said. They said Gideon was going to take that back from Mrs. Needle, so that's good too, right? I guess. But how come Octavio didn't know anything about it? How could it be sitting right there in his house and the guy who knew everything didn't know? Lucinda still found the idea of Tyler meeting old, long-dead Octavio Tinker in a spooky tunnel under the ground, something, something she didn't really want to talk about too much. Hey, she said, I brought Uncle Gideon's worst enemy onto the property and lived to tell about it. Everything about Ordinary Farm is crazy. Tyler laughed. I can't believe you did that, sis. You were, you were awesome. Thinking about it now, the whole thing was Stillman terrified her. What, what had she been thinking? But what was done was done. It had worked out all right. No use getting worked up about it. Wow, she thought. That's almost like something Tyler would say. Suddenly, she was glad to have a brother. I hope everything's going to be okay. And I really want to go back there soon. Maybe over Thanksgiving. Tyler laughed again. That girl who was saying all last summer, I want to go home? Wasn't that you? Yeah. And that kid who was saying, gee, Lucinda, sorry I kept getting into trouble? Sorry I kept getting you into trouble too? Wasn't that you? No, wait. It wasn't because you never say that. A year before, Tyler would have snapped at her or just plugged back into his game boss and ignored her. Well, Somebody has to make things happen, he said. That's my job. Oh, and you're good at it too, Tyler Jenkins, she told him, smiling despite herself. Way too good. They stopped talking after a while, and Tyler went back to guiding his hamster wizard through its perilous quest. But Lucinda kept losing track of the words in her book, and looking out the window didn't cheer her up either. She was still miserable at how things had ended up with the dragons. After all that Lucinda had done that summer, all her kind, slow, careful attempts to build a connection with the dragons and especially with little Desta, the whole thing had gone kaboom in a matter of moments. But I didn't want to do it, she thought. I didn't want to upset her. I had to do it to save the farm, to save Gideon and everyone else, even the dragons. The hurt was so sharp that for a moment she could almost feel what she had felt that night, the storm of Desta's angry, terrified thoughts, and how she had forced herself to ignore them. Thinking about it made Lucinda feel as if she had a chunk of ice in the middle of her chest where her heart should be. I'm so sorry, she thought. I'm so sorry, Desta. Carrot girl sad? It surprised her so much she gasped. Desta? Is that you? The dragon thoughts were faint, like the voice you could only hear when the wind was blowing the right direction. But at the moment, that was just the direction it was blowing. Desta? Sad why? How could she explain such things to a dragon, and a young dragon at that, especially when they might only have moments? Carrot girl is sad because she made Desta sad. 
didn't want to, had to, but still sad. Care girl, sorry. Care girl, so very, very sorry. There was a long pause, and Lucinda was certain she had lost the fleeting contact then. Sorry, and Lucinda was certain she had lost the fleeting contact. Then, care girl, make better? What? W w what can I do to make it better? I I'm going away now for months and months. Lucinda did her best to convey the feeling of time. Moons waxing and waning one after another. Gone long. What can I do? Come back soon. The thought came with a tickle of dragonly amusement. Next time, bring more carrots? Millions of carrots. The thought was of a pile as high as the sky. Laughter, like a stream of warm, smoky bubbles, floated through her mind. Then the touch was gone, and Lucinda Jenkins was alone in her own head once more. The End Sorry, I once again misjudged. <laughs> um, sorry, I once again misjudged the uh, length of time, but uh, thank you for bearing with me. I see Tash showed up. Hello, Tash. Um, and Chris, good to see you too. Um, by the way, Culpepper, the name of the horse, that actually comes from Culpepper's Herbal uh, Compendium, which was a, a famous book on herbal lore that Deb used to have that uh, she got. I think she might have gotten it originally when we started writing um, Ordinary Farm. And um, we were reading it for uh, Mrs. Needle's Herbology, and Deborah decided to name the horse Culpepper. So full credit for that name goes to Deb. Anyway, so with that, it has been a long night. I thank you for your, um, your attention. As I said, I believe next week I will be reading, I will start reading uh, Brothers of the Wind, which may be the last thing I read for a while, but I don't know. Um, but I am planning to do that next week at the same Tad Time, same Tad channel. So s come back, come hang with me then. Um, meanwhile, I will just say thank you so much for everything. I already said thank you. you. You get it, right? Thank you. Thank you. Gratitude. Okay. And uh, I hope you'll take good care of yourselves, your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors. Um, help people who need help. And someday they may help you. But even if they don't, you are paying it forward. So with that, I say thank you so much. Peace. And peace out. I'll see you later. Okay. Good night.